Okay, everybody, um, welcome. And uh, we now have 17 people on board, so um, please be cognizant of that. Um, very, very, very briefly, the uh, site review. Um, normally, I, I, I give this to all of my colleagues here at Revolt, and we basically go through how the system should be approached every time you go to a new site. And there are a couple of main points about it. One, the very first one is always health and safety. Uh, a lot of times I've seen batteries uh, propped up against the wall. Um, they, they are at risk of, you know, they just put on the floor because they're in nice steel boxes that people don't realize or the, the homeowners don't realize that you're not allowed to put water on them. Um, and they, you know, they can even put, shut their drink down. Um, but otherwise, the main thing is to make sure that they don't, um, that your batteries and equipment are not in the way of uh, falling on top of people or giving people electric shots or allowing um, steel pieces to be joining any DC paths and uh, uh, shorting out equipment. Um, you, obviously, that's, that's the very first thing you do when you, when you get to the, uh, the site. The second part would be to... Um, yeah, that's okay. Second part is, is to do is to always check for the mechanics of the site. So the DC system, uh, check all your, your joints, your connections, and then check the bus bar. Now that's point number five. The, point, the bus bar is, uh, is critical in the DC system. Um, I know I overstated, but uh, I think it's, uh, it cannot be overstated. The, impact of putting in a good uh, bus bar is immediate. I had a, a client with five Revolve uh, battery sets um, and they had a very nice bus bar but with um, slightly different DC parts and the result was each of the BMSs were um, were at slightly different voltages and slightly different uh, delivery of capacity of, of power. You know, so there would, um, the one battery would deliver 100%, another battery would deliver only 98%, another battery would deliver only 80%. And it was because of the disparity uh, basically between the BMS or the, the, the battery system and the bus bar in terms of DC lens and the bus bar itself uh, wasn't um, aligned with alternating uh, alternating plugs. So you, what, what you want to try and do is you want to put a, a battery lug on the one side, then you put an MPPT, or actually you put an inverter between the battery lug and the, um, the MPPT lug, and then you try and uh, uh, space them equally and so forth. Um, that inverter transparency, what I mean by that in, in point number five is you actually want to make sure that the, there's no current that can go between the MPPT and the battery without the, MP, without the inverter actually seeing it. So you must always try and make sure that there's a lug for the inverter between those two lugs. Um, it's just a, 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 an attempt to handle the, uh, the, the path of, of least resistance or the, the shortest path um, that is taken by a current and to try and get everything to see each other. Um, check the polarity in each battery, uh, check that the, the, there's um, protection of all the live parts. Um, the, the BMS, number, point number eight, the BMS is a 48 volt BMS. So the, uh, the, the entire power of the BMS is, um, it should be 48, not 24. I have seen a couple of people put a, the little brown cable, which is the positive cable, um, across onto the same. Sorry, there's more people waiting to come into the meeting. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Apologies. I don't know. Yeah. I thought I told you, you say people to limit this to 10 people. We've got, now 19, 20 people, it's very good. Anyway, uh, the, yeah, the, the, the little brown cable was attached to the, the very first battery 
from which the um, the uh, negative for the for the BMS was also coming from, which effectively meant that the BMS would be in power for 24 votes instead of 48 votes. And in one case, it was fine. In another case, I had to actually break the BMS. Um, I suspect it, they also pulled out the plug at some point when it was charging or something like that. But anyway, always try and make sure it's across 48 volts um, and check the, the BMS dip addresses. That you should always leave it at, at point one, at one or two, three, four, depending on the number. But you know, just have a um, a convention that at least keeps it off zero and allows everyone to to speak to it. Number ten, confirm the power ratios of your system when you when you're out there doing the troubleshooting. What I mean by that is that if you have uh, an inverter on the wall that's a 10 kVA, then you should have uh, 20 kilowatt hours of battery on the floor and four times your 10 kVA on the roof in terms of solar production. What I mean by that is obviously it must be the peak production of your solar panels. So normally it's about um, 3,000 uh, watts for a a 10 kVA system, um, and you multiply that by the uh, number of available hours, average number of available hours of sunlight, and Victoria is five and a half. So three times five and a half, you get about 15 to 18. So 18 is a little bit borderline for a 10 kVA system in Victoria. But that, that ratio is a uh, rule of thumb, and it is as uh, a guidance. Um, I have seen that as you slowly violate that, your problem of having um, low power or not enough energy put, brought back into the batteries uh, gets exacerbated during the year, just uh, about one or two times a month um, if you have bad weather. Um, and then of course, with it, when you're at a site, you then connect your BMS and, ch and check parameters. I'll show you the um, upper computer software now. Um, or later on in the, uh, in the in this presentation there. Um, in the, the site review, uh, the physical part of it, the connection of your battery cables, okay? One of the nice things I've seen uh, that Victron does is, is the guidance about the size of the, um, of the inverters as compared to the size of the the fuses and the sizes of the um, of the cabling, and you know they don't actually go down below uh, 35 mil, uh, millimeter. We do su supply um, uh, 25 mil millimeter um, cabling. Now that is the minimum that these batteries can do, and they are assumed to be running across what, one or two meters of um, of DC complete length. Um, so if you're doing more than one meter, then please bump it up to uh, 35 and 50 millimeter. I have seen a nice reduction in, uh, in DC ripple, simply by uh, doubling up the cable. And the one that I actually saw, which was very nice is to, link the two uh, internal terminals. So between the, um, the, the positive and negative of the two batteries that you're then linking to make into a 48, um, I see, see guys have been putting in two 25 millimeter runs just to uh, make sure that that's, uh, that battery set acts as one unit and it reduces the internal resistance dramatically between those two batteries. It's quite a nice idea to double up on the, on the internals. Um, there we go. The site fuses. Um, this is quite a, an issue. Um, a lot of people are still putting in 150 amp fuses uh, or 160s or even 250 amp, um, so 250 amp uh, DC breakers. Um, so now the, the problem is that a, a, a trip switch is actually to my mind, um, the best uh, device to install. You have to have um, some form of fusing on the positive line and if, the, if you have a trip switch, 150 amp trip switch, 
the customer can go and flick up the, uh, the switch without anyone else coming to his site. So it just saved a lot of um, site visits. Um, but a 150 amp trip switch uh, is effective and is about as high as you want to go. I have got people who would install it. If you are out there who say that they want to standardize at 125 amps, um, so it's quite a good idea uh, to standardize at a, if you're using a trip switch or DC uh, trip switch, to still do 125 amps uh, trip switch. Although, um, and that is of course what um, the Victron recommendation is um, on the, the previous slide. So, um, so uh, to, to stay with 125 amps. Um, but the main point about that uh, slide, which is to say, look guys, make sure you have your, your fuses in there and make it 125 amp fuses. Otherwise, 150 amp uh, DC breaker is about as good as I can, I can improve. But pretty much everyone that I talk to, when they put in the DC breaker, they still do 125 amp DC breaker. Uh, with regards to inverter setup, um, I've got two, two diagrams here. The first one at the top there is the, the different envelopes of voltage. So the battery's full operating envelope is between 44 volts and 59 volts. Yeah, slightly more than 59, doesn't matter. The BMS is between 47,6 up to 57,6. So there's a 10-volt uh, window there. And the inverter should always sit in between those two to make sure that the BMS doesn't uh, shut down uh, as, uh, in response to a, or a lack of response from the inverter. So if the inverter is overcharging past 57,6 or allowing the battery, the BMS and the battery to drain below 47,6. Um, so just bear, that, bear in mind that sort of inverted uh, Pyramid of the operating envelope for the for voltages, and if you do, if you have that in mind, all your your inverter setups will, setups will be will be uh, great in crystal. Um, I see my little, little blue arrow here has actually moved. It shouldn't be where it is. It actually should be slightly over. Um, this is a very nice uh, graphic to describe the energy levels uh, at the different voltages of each cell, each lithium ion or lithium ferrophosphate um, cell in, in the battery. So the batteries, uh, the, the, the cell can be charged from um, 2.5 volts up to 3.7 volts. However, the majority of the power um, actually comes in between 3.1 volts and 3.4 volts, okay? So 80%, if not more, 85, maybe even 90% of the power resides in what is effectively a 0.3 volt window, okay? So everything that we are gearing our BMS and battery and uh, uh, inverters to do is to operate essentially in the uh, 3.0 volt to the 3.5 volt window. If you're in that window, you actually have all the power that you need. There are a little bit of powers over here in the, um, in the site, but you can see it's in the order of two to three percent, okay? So it, that graphic will help you a lot to understand why, for example, you will see the, um, the overall voltage of a system sit at 52,5 volts for hours. Um, two, two hours and then drop down to 50, 52 comma three volts and sit there for another two hours and it just means you're slowly de delivering power uh, in that part of the of the power band of, of each cell so moving into problems that I see in the field this is the brief summary of everything that I've been ad addressing or, or my, my team's been addressing um, the short delay. The short delay was a, it's a problem for all lithium batteries. The, the BMSs are trying to prevent a short circuit 
Um, so they should be should be allowing a quick uh, draw of current for startup um, as the inverters all take take power. Um, however, the inverters tend to be a little bit big compared to the um, the power that they that the battery that are supposed to be delivering. So in startup, they tend to be a much higher current than the uh, BMS is expecting. And so it will kick off its little, little delay and trip out the BMS. And that's why occasionally you get a BMS uh, giving you a red light error whenever you try to do the startup. And what it's basically doing is it's seeing it's the, the current draw from the BMS from the inverter as a short circuit and it's coming in with a, um, with a protection. We can uh, modify the software on the BMS, uh, just the parameters, and expand that delay. Um, in the past, we've actually been doing that automatically from the warehouse. And then what we did uh, have is a, a development on our BMS side where they had allowed for a pre-charge circuit the pre-charge circuit was fantastic for um, most of the BMSs and, and inverter scenarios, but it still didn't cater for the slightly larger one, for the, the rich one, 15 kVA systems, uh, would still trip out. Uh, and if you had a, a heavy load going through the system at the time when ESCOM or the grid shut down, the, uh, the short delay would kick in again and you, you would redline your, um, your BMS and then it would, it would boot up two minutes later. So uh, I have been, again, just uh, setting the BMS uh, short delay across the board um, w way up again. So the issue on that is uh, you as installers simply cannot uh, short circuit your system. They do not put any positive line onto that, uh, onto the big lugs of your BMS. Otherwise you will short circuit your system and you will blow it up. Uh, temperature probes, I have seen a couple of times where the temperature probe is either not working or uh, disconnected internally from the, uh, from the little uh, communication port in the battery. Um, if I have uh, uh, the, the disconnect, um, it can be brought back to the lab here in Ferndale and we can fix it very quickly and very easily. It's about a, a half an hour to a one hour process. Um, so that's the first step. The second step is if you use one of the older, uh, what we call the KTM style batteries or my personal favorite, the K9. Um, there the temperature probe in, are internal and we cannot uh, adjust those, we cannot fix those but I do have software where I can turn off the temperature probe. Um, it's not gonna be a big problem in terms of long-term because there is still another, another temperature probe in the other battery. And these, uh, these uh, batteries are lithium ferrophosphate. So they actually do not really have a temperature issue. Their runaway temperature is uh, 700, uh, Celsius, 700 degrees Celsius. Um, which is much better than the 230 degrees Celsius of the other lithium batteries. Um, so it's not really a big deal. I think we've pretty much handled any uh, temperature probe issued in, in the older batteries that are out in the field already. Uh, so if there are any newer ones, uh, you will see it on the um, Apple computer software and you can just bring the battery back in to, to uh, revolve and we can fix it. Um, I have seen uh, voltage overload due to grid and DC ripple. Uh, DC ripple is mostly uh, DC circuit design. It means you've got too many connections, too many bolt-ons all the way through your, your DC circuit, uh, or you have uh, the cable you're using is, is too thin, uh, rather go up to 50 mil and so forth. Uh, on the grid side, so voltage overload in the grid side is uh, basically ESCOM sending a high voltage, low current uh, surge or vice versa. Uh, it happens either during a um, transformer blowout. It can happen due to um, uh, uh, load shedding. Uh, apparently we've seen that. 
and I have got um, uh, Dane Fern, uh, I think I've described it to Curry before, where the, on one side they have a lot of illegals uh, in, in illegal connections, sorry, illegal connections, and on the other side they have four ways, which has a lot of um, construction, and as a result, Dane Fern has uh, quite dirty grid power, so you get these surges. In order to handle those surges, obviously you need to have um, protection on the on the board, and that's why most people, uh, if they have a surge, the, the master switch just trips and they, you know, they trip, trip it back up, and they have power again, and all the illegal connections actually get burnt out. However, we do have the ability to adjust the BMS uh, parameters there again. There's a parameter there that allows me to do uh, pack uh, over voltage delay as well. The pack over, over voltage delay is normally set at one second um, coming out of the, the factory. Uh, one second is fairly arbitrary, but it's also quite a long period for a, a battery. Uh, and I can, with, with quite, uh, quite good certainty, double that to two seconds. I have asked China if I can double it to uh, three and maybe even four seconds, and they, they blanched the thought. But um, I'm not actually removing all of the protection because I still have a voltage overload delay um, for this on a cell level, so on a per cell basis. And what you do there is you leave that one, that, that delay at one second, that is always at one second, and you just uh, increase the delay on the pack. And the pack level will, uh, what, what we see in it, that when Eskom does these surges, the surge actually resides on the outside of the pack in effect. It's not really going into every cell. So the, the overall battery, gets a surge up to say 60 volts, 63, up to 65 volts. And that it only lasts for about uh, 0.5 uh, of a second. And, but that's enough to trip out the BMS at a, at, with a one second delay. And it doesn't trip with a two second delay. So that's one of the, one of the adjustments I can do. And so if you are seeing um, dirty grid, Another place I've seen lots of dirty grid is uh, warm baths, Bella Bella. Um, if you are seeing that, we can adjust it, okay? Uh, battery cell imbalance. So I've got uh, one battery actually in my lab right now where they, they for some reason, have uh, induced an imbalance between all the cells. Um, and so I've got it on what we call a, a T8 um, uh, balancer. Um, what I, the, the, the big um, uh, contributor to uh, cell imbalances is when people don't respect the, uh, the pairing that they, the, the batteries come in. So every battery comes with a, uh, a, a, both a quite a big number on it, um, AF142. Uh, and it should have either you know, in the pair another one saying AF142 or AF142B. Um, the, the, the C8, the, the lower, smaller battery, uh, that one, the, the serial number will show you, it will end in an A and a B, and you must keep those serial numbers packed together. If you do that, um, the battery has paired the batteries as, um, as two batteries that have the closest um, num number of cells that are, are close to each other. And they will then, from that point, run together, uh, you know, together forever. The, uh, if you don't respect that, it's not a big deal. And sometimes you can't. Um, sometimes you, you stop things out and so forth. It's not a big deal, but you will see that you would like to try and get the two batteries as close to, to each other when you install them in terms of um, uh, both overall voltage and uh, the internal voltage. So try and respect that and you won't have any issues with the cell imbalances. Um, otherwise, if you do, we do have solutions. Um, obviously, another problem we see in the field is uh, no fuse protection. I've actually seen um, 
one of, one of our installers had, had issues with his, um, or what he thought was his, his BMS. Oh, it was his BMS. He, he had an issue because he didn't have the short delay expanded. Um, but he wanted to put the site on. So he just unplugged the, um, the BMS and ran the battery straight to the, um, to the inverter. Now, that is, is simply not, uh, not feasible. It's certainly not uh, uh, you know, supported in any sense of way. Matter of fact, you violate the, um, the, the warranty clauses. The reason for that is because without the BMS, there's no control in the cell level. So you could charge your battery up to only 54 volts, but you end up having one of the cells um, uh, charged up more than the others and, and, and you know, she's been cooked at about uh, four volts when she, the maximum she's supposed to go to is um, 4.3.7. Is um, so please, fuses and BMSs must be on the system. Uh, if you, the, 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 BMS, the BMS themselves do have internal protection for current, so they do have internal software fuses. Um, they will trip at 160 amps, and they will trip uh, even faster at, if you go above 180 amps. Um, the, the, uh, the, the issue with that is you are, are doing a four and a half thousand rand BMS as your fuse when you could use a 400 rand uh, DC breaker as, as your fuse. And I, I have, uh, I, I've got a colleague who actually uses his BMS as a fuse uh, 11 times and they were pushing through um, 250, 270, uh, and at and one time 307 amps, just briefly through the system. Um, and eventually on the 11th time, it, it stopped the BMS. Um, so the BMS did handle it, but it, it's, uh, it was more than double its, its rated capacity and so eventually gave out, please don't do that. Uh, bent or damaged harnesses. Now, what I mean by that is the black harnesses that connect your BMS to the battery, the monitoring harnesses. Um, it, it, it's a little bit of a uh, sort of a plumbing thing that people tie them hard with a, um, with a, uh, a table tie. And what it does is it compresses these very thin little wires um, that are meant to be monitoring resistance and uh, voltage effectively down to one thousandth of a volt. And if you do uh, bend them too much and actually uh, one that the, the internal cable wire snapped and joined another little wire. So the BMS was seeing six volts on one cell and zero volts on the other cell. Uh, so please um, look after those harnesses. Uh, you can stash them nicely on the side or underneath you know, in the gap between the um, battery and the BMS. Um, but don't do any nice, don't do any right angle bend to them. Um, a common problem there is you put the system into a very nice door, I mean a cabinet, and the door of the cabinet will fold the, um, the cables coming off those uh, serial ports and give them into a 90 degree bend and, and therefore break the little, little wires inside. Um, I, I solved the problem the one time to me by pushing the batteries further back and pulling the, the cabinet slightly off the wall just by an inch or so. And that gave plenty of space to close the door without impacting the, um, the harnesses. Um, then a lot of uh, inverter settings and uh, small solar things. Um, by small solar, I mean there's not enough solar compared to the house design. So there's a house right here in, um, in Randburg where they have a very good system, very, very well designed. The client uh, went slightly small, um, but he knew that. He just wanted a backup system. Um, but, uh, and so his system was operating perfectly. But over time, he got uh, more familiar or more lackadaisical with his, um, his system. 
and try to use his DC system power a little more uh, uh, stringently. You know, so he was using the microwave and the and the um, the kettle at the same time during uh, load shedding, and so he started depleting his battery a little bit, and his solar wasn't enough to maintain both the the power in the in the house that would, would have been required by the house and to fill the battery. Um, so he was quite routinely running out of power at night, and it, it was a nice problem to have because in the end he just said, "Okay, I understand my problem. I'm as a house, I I have too too much demand, too much power requirement for the amount of solar panels I have." So you know. He, he boosted the solar panels. Um, to address, yeah, so you must always, always check the, the ratio and just address it. The poor inverter settings. Um, inverters, the, I, I, I have been uh, given to anyone who asks and published on the website now, my guidance on terms of um, the, uh, the, the settings per inverter type and inverter model. Uh, please use them. However, there's a couple of caveats. One, the, um, the, the paradigm upon, upon which each user is using his, um, his backup power system is different. Some people want to uh, only run lights and, and plugs. Some people want, want to make sure their, um, their power costs from ESCOM are being reduced. Some people just want power assurance. Some people want, uh, yeah, all of the things. Um, so the inverter settings must be taken in conjunction with that. They must be correlated. And, and as a matter of fact, I've just about to say, if you've used my inverter settings perfectly without changing any of my settings, you've probably done something wrong because every site needs to be uh, slightly customized. Um, for the, the, the user's experience and for the users, the way they, they, they do it. I am getting closer and closer to uh, getting uh, settings that are bulletproof. And when I get to that point, I will tell you all that I've got. Uh, that this is the best setting you can get. And um, no matter what the client does, you, you, you'll be okay. I, I don't think I'll ever get there, but I'm getting closer. Um, so troubleshooting. If there is no charging, uh, but predominantly uh, I, I get a call that says, you know, your batteries are not working, there's no charging. And when I get, get, get on site, the first one that I forget to do, but I should always do is check the fuses because that has been the majority of the problems. The, um, I've, I've been on a site where the negative line was blown but the positive line was fine, so it wasn't charging, but it was taking charge. Um, it's just this the nature of the of the DC. It was it was it was open enough to to deliver from the battery, but uh, the battery couldn't take the charge. Um, I've also been in a site where the uh, the current protection to so the protection on the current was set at 60 amps instead of 160 amps. And so every time they, they started to charge it, it would, it would draw power, no problem, because the, the customer was only using about 45 amps. But then when it, um, when it came time to charge it, they were specifically charging at 60 amps and the thing would, would trip out. So I, I, it was a software thing. I just it was easily able to, um, to, to adjust it and, and fix it. Um, obviously, check the cable run for continuity and um, yeah, make sure that the, the battery is higher than 48 volts so that the BMS can come on and, and, and allow the, the inverter to come on and, and start charging. Um, I had had a client out in the field who had drained his battery. Uh, he had an expert con um, inverter and uh, he needed the power and he just drained the battery down to 47 volts. The expert was set at, uh, well, the BMS itself was set at uh, 47,6 volts, so he couldn't get it charged up. So what he did was he bypassed the BMS with a, uh, a cable um, straight to his inverter, 
charge the battery uh, from his 47 volts up to 49 volts, and then disconnected everything and put the BMS back together and charge back up. And it worked perfectly. And I've been into the system, and the system is still healthy and brilliant. Um, so please, it's a it's a it's a dirty way of doing it. We tr try not to be um, to bypass the BMS. Um, I knew the guy knew what he's doing. I wouldn't. I would never tell that to a, uh, a, a, a normal end user. Um, but he knew what he's doing. Um, BMS chips. So the yeah the, the BMS will chip will go into protection for uh, low low state of charge and for electrical short circuits. Um, and for uh, high co current charge. Um, so, of course, make sure that you're, you do have um, enough power on the battery, 48 volts and above, um, and that you do have the short delay in place. And then there's another scenario coming up. Uh, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll address it in another scenario. Um, inverters. So what, one of the things that I've noticed is the, uh, the expert float. So expert in some of the older models, I believe they have corrected it in, not corrected, they've changed the, um, the float paradigm for um, the Kings, the Mercer King, which is a very nice model. Um, but in some of the older models, they have one here in the lab. Um, what they do is it charges up to the, the float voltage, so 54 and a half volts, and then it slowly over 14 minutes allows that voltage to drop down to as low as 53.8 volts, and then charges back up. Um, and it just keeps doing this uh, zigzag um, float performance of in the voltage which is actually um, uh, uh, not poor, but it, it does start to count on the BMS as a partial discharge. Um, so the, it, like one-tenth of a cycle is then re recorded by the BMS, even though it's just doing a float. Um, so you could end up being, uh, doing a day of float, which is only uh, five hours, and you end up having 0.4 of a, of a battery cycle done, even though we're just in float. Um, this is a, an irritation of, a, of the float paradigm for that, for that model. Um, I'm using the word picture on there, but most other um, inverters, they have a very nice system where it stays at 54.5, then it steps up briefly in a heavy side step, uh, I think the voltage jumped only about 2.2 volts. Um, Stepped up and then it degrades slowly back down to uh, 54.5. And that is a much better float paradigm. It's keeping the, the lithium alive. It's busy jumping up and down. Um, so the, the lithium light state, that's why you're doing float. Um, and it's, it's not uh, going down below 54.5 um, uh, volt for the the synergy that I have here in the lab. Um, if I have an ESCOM outage, I could actually be at 54 volts and have lost about four, maybe five, maybe even seven percent of my available capacity just because I was in that city float paradigm. Um, enough about float. Inverter shutdowns. As the the um, Irritating part about this is on Vitron, you get a little uh, light flashing saying um, low battery alarm. And the battery is sitting still at 53 volts. Uh, the, the issue is uh, either a, a over voltage or indeed a drain battery. I've seen a, a battery um, being drained down to say 50, 51, 50 volts. And then a big load comes on. It drops it below the um, the, uh, the the cutoff voltages on both the uh, inverter and the BMS, but the BMO, BMS is off first, and so it sends the message back, or effectively the the um, Vitron 
sees it as being off and so we start flashing a little uh, low battery alarm even though the, the victim itself goes off and then comes back on um, and then you, you, you as a user walk up, up to the thing and you see that everything's on um, it was off for two, two minutes it's now on you still have 50.2 volts on your battery um, and your your little red light flashing low battery is on the Victron, um, which it shouldn't be. It's still 0.7 volts higher than where, where it should be in terms of low battery. Um, don't be don't be alarmed. It's just it's a typical um, behavior. It just means that people were effectively abusing the, the, the power available to them. Um, the Victron, the BMSs, they, they, they can't look into the future, so they uh, they can't say, you know, even though they're saying, look, we've got 20% uh, power, and you suddenly turn on the, the kettle and there's the iron, and you, you drain, it, drain it within two minutes, that is uh, that is correct, that is what's, what's happening, and you just gotta train your, your customer to use it. The other um, uh, big reason I see for, for uh, BMS's, uh, yeah, BMS is shutting down or Victron shutting down is the MPPT. The MPPT setting, there is a, um, a balancing voltage uh, or equalization voltage setting on the uh, Victron MPPT. It must be set at any value above the absorption voltage of the, the battery. Uh, if it's not, you get an error 13, which will, will shut down uh, either the BMS or the, or the Bitron. Um, I don't know which, it, 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 it's a little bit um, indeterminate. Um, so what you do is you just set it up higher, even though the MPPT is doing no equalization, it still uses that value somewhere in its calculations. So, um, uh, yeah, just 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 set it right. The I have seen um, what's the other one? Where firmware isn't isn't updated. So you have different. They've updated the MPPT and they've updated uh, the CCGX, but they haven't updated the actual Victron. Um, just little things like that can actually cause um, not shutdowns, but mismatches in in readings and understanding. Um, troubleshooting low voltage. I don't know if the video will work over um, over the the, uh, the the Zoom thing, but here's a nice example of the system was actually in sleep. You can see it was shut down, so it was dark. And when you try to do the reset, it actually went uh, from right to left first and then from right to left, and then shut up, uh, it got turn on, on like this. There you, what you saw there was all the lights came on and then the whole thing went dark. Now, what he actually has is all the lights coming on is just a BMS test, but the next thing you should see with, when all those uh, four lights go on, you should see uh, at least one, if not two green lights still remaining on and there wasn't even a flash of them. That's an indication that the, the battery did low voltage um, and the system goes in, into protection, uh, which is the shutdown. Now it's actually right now in sleep. It's not actually off. Um, if, you, if you push that reset button again, it will go from uh, right to left and then go off. Uh, and then you turn it on again by going from right to left, uh, from left to right. Uh, so it's often something to, to check when you, you when you come to a site where you're doing troubleshooting um, to see whether the BMS was in sleep or uh, shutdown mode. Um, nine times out of ten, that you're in sleep. Okay. Uh, in this in this particular case, I had a defect on the um, on the internal bus bar of the battery. And I brought the battery in, and it was just a missing bolt. So there was a manufacturing error in the missing bolt, and I replaced the bolt, and, and it worked perfectly. Um, so yeah. Then no, yeah. Uh, bad cell. Wow, it's a little bit loud. Sorry. So there he actually has all the, bat all the cells were in, um, 
we're, we're fully charged and the system goes into petition like this. So the, the, the green lights came on um, at the end of, the, at the, end of the, the boot up and there you can see everything working and it's supposed to be working, there you go, and then down. Now there you can see it was indicating for you that the battery is charged but it's still going into an error. And what the error was here is that the connection between the, um, the external harness and the internal harness uh, had, had been blown. Um, I don't know how the, the guy did it, but he did it. And so all we did was re repair that and put it back together. So it, the difference between those two videos was the fact that you could see that it was ch fully charged and the other one you could see it was fully not charged. Um, Felix, sorry. Yes, I just want to cut in quickly. Um, I'm making a list of questions that people are asking in the chat, but I believe Anita just asked a question um, that you can maybe explain now. Um, can you explain the meaning of the BMS light flashing from left to right versus right to left? Um, she hasn't seen it anywhere in our manual. Very good. Um, going back to the previous one. So, I'm going to go on. Um, when you when you do a when you first turn on your your BMS, you will actually see the BMS uh, light come on. Okay, ah, sorry. There. So when you first. Um, Zoom is not allowing me to do. Okay, when you first turn on your BMS, you will see the lights start from the left-hand side of the, of the uh, seven LED lights. So the, the green left-hand side. It will do a little um, Knight Rider sequence where it boots up from uh, left to right. And then after that, it will uh, store in the knife rider sequence, go from right to left. If you, so, so if you push that reset button and that's how it starts up, you know you're turning the, the BMS on. If you push the reset button and it starts up on the right, in other words, right next to the reset button and goes the other way and then stops, you know you just turned off your BMS. So when I run this video, you will see he turns off the BMS first. The whole thing is dark, but he turns it off when he pushes it. You see now those lights are running from right to left, okay? Now he's gonna push it again. This is the actually turning the BMS on. This will happen every time you turn the BMS on. It runs from left to right, it pauses there, runs to the, that one, clicks and moves on. Uh, at that point there, you should see, uh, it, it goes all green and then you should see two green lights normally uh, for showing, indicating a 50% state of charge and the system is on, okay? In this case, there was, there was no charge, the system went off. Um, but just to that question, um, if you hit the reset button and, the, and you're starting up the BMS, it would do a, uh, a move from left to right, and then uh, from right to left and turn on, and you will see all the, BM, the LED lights that indicate just your state of charge. If you push that button, if it's all dark like this, and you push the button, the reset button, and it goes from the reset button the other way to, to the left, you know you turn off your BMS, and it, it actually was in sleep mode at the time that you were, you were resetting it. Don't worry about that. Sleep mode. That's what it's actually my next slide. <laughs> um, sleep mode actually happens if there is a couple of um, some scenarios. Um, if there's no energy transfer for one day, so if uh, specifically for 1,440 minutes, if there is no uh, energy taken by the battery or taken to the battery or to the BMS or to the inverter or any direction, for a day, the, the BMS will turn off and look like it's dark. 
There will be no light shine on the LEDs. However, the, the BMS actually is still on, it's just in sleep mode. It's, it's gone into a low drainage state, and so it's gone to sleep mode. Alternative uh, problem is you've drained the battery and you're not charging it, you're just sitting there. The low voltage reading from the, from the battery will uh, turn the, um, the, the BMS off. It's not actually turned off, it's just in sleep mode and you'll see that if you touch, touch the, um, the reset button and it, it goes from right to left. Um, it can also happen and for protection for an overvolted cell. Um, so your, your system does go dark, but it can also be still in sleep. Um, I have had a blown board where the BMS is still able to come on, um, but it actually sh showed as the, uh, the lights being off. Um, they, they had simply blown the, the board, which was um, the, the, the logic board, and it was amazing that it had blown. Um, so, if, if you have, um, oh, the, the big one, if you have number one, um, it's, it's actually unusual, and the main cause for it is if there's a fuse that's been blown in the system, and you don't realize it, and you, you, your system doesn't realize it, and it doesn't do any energy transfer, uh, doesn't indicate to you, and in the end, the uh, BMS just turns off, and you run around looking for the BMS uh, problem, and matter of fact, it's just a, a, a fuse problem. Um, if you have an overcharge or undercharge scenario, uh, just get the system back up to 49 volts or above. Uh, so check with a, a multimeter and bring the inverter on with it with, um, with AC power and charge it. Uh, I have put there, you may need to bypass the BMS and I should, um, uh, I, I should caution against it, of course, but also in the client that I had who, who I, I told him to bypass the BMS control with the cable, he did not have any AC at the house. Um, they were out in uh, Northern Western Cape and so their only power was solar uh, and, and the batteries. So he simply bypassed the, the system with, with the, the cable and charged with solar until he could get the whole thing going. Um, two batteries with different voltages. Now, I kind of addressed it already, but uh, that's with, when you have mismatched pairs. Um, so the, the very first uh, scenario, scenario one, is when the two batteries have, are being paired together and they have different voltages or different state of charges on the, um, on the battery. That is actually... Uh, uh, you, you should try and, and uh, keep that together, keep, keep it, um, uh, the pairing together to, to avoid it. But what happens is uh, you have the two batteries moving up and down together and they have a, a voltage difference of say half a volt. And over every cycle that half volt slowly um, will, will disappear as the BMS balances. But uh, the, the BMS is balancing at basically three amps per cycle, and it balances for the first hour of, of every float and during the, um, the charge up and, and absorption. So you only really have about, um, well, let me tell you now, it's half, a, half a volt will take you probably 20 or 30 cycles before the two of them are finally um, uh, together. Um, in contrast, and this is uh, to my, my expert in, in, in praise of my expert here in the, uh, in the lab, that's irritating um, jagged edge float scenario uh, effectively does cycles, which allows the BMS to uh, balance pretty much all the time. And so I've actually had uh, a pack on there that was balanced within about seven or eight days um, when they had a 0.3 volt disparity between the two. Um, just, just for note, your BMS will not do any balancing until the, um, the, uh, the voltage disparity 
is about 0 0.05 volts, so uh, 50 millivolts. Um, the reason for that is you just, if you don't want them to, to waste uh, energy and time on balancing in, uh, any lower than that, and any lower than that is typically not, not an issue, so it's just something for you to know. Um, if you have a, uh, for number two, you could also have an internal fault where the um, either external harnesses are, are damaged and therefore they're misinforming the BMS as to the voltage on the um, on the, the batteries. So if you've overstressed the external harness, you can be reporting to the, um, the BMS that the cell is at, um, at 3.5 volts. And meanwhile, the cell is at 3.3 volts. Um, so it, it starts balancing all the other cells according to this cell, which is at 3.5, and it's trying to drain power from that cell and so forth, and it, so it becomes a bit of a mess. So it's, it's quite an important thing to keep that external harness undamaged. Um, a couple of things that you can do if you have got uh, number one, uh, uh, if you can do it remotely is of course connect the two um, internal terminals with another uh, 25 millimeter cable. Um, you can also swap the, uh, the connection so that what was battery one and two is now the other way around, battery two and one, in terms of how the DC power is coming into the batteries. I haven't seen it, made it make a big difference. The theory is that your uh, your electrons are always coming from your negative side of the terminal when you're doing charge up. And so maybe the first battery that gets hit. There's no way, as soon as I move the back here, my boss wants to know yeah. what's happening, you know? Um, sorry? Okay. Uh, so the, 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 the first battery, you, 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 you sometimes want to shop it around and, and see if the, if, if it being closer to the, the charge point will get a little bit more voltage. Um, what did you people recommend it? I'm not, I'm not that sold in that. Uh, yeah. And then the third way is to charge, discharge the battery completely, uh, then disconnect the Victron system and leave the BMS connected and turned on. So the BMS uh, will balance at the lower end and then slowly bring up the, um, you know, you, you reconnect the, uh, the inverter and slowly bring the, um, the, the charges back up. Um, the only problem with that is you do have to be above 3.3 volts with the, uh, with the, before active balancing starts, but uh, the batteries themselves do balance a little bit in, in the low voltage state. So, yeah, and the third way is just to, to drain it completely and then slowly bring it all the way back up. I have done systems where we, we, we've been using charging amps at 60 to 80 amps, and I've dropped that down to 25 amps per set, and I've seen that gap close quite dramatically in every cycle, uh, simply because you're giving an extra hour of balancing uh, time per, per cycle. So. That's another, another possible solution. Finally, we got uh, a couple of BMS views. This is the upper computer software. Uh, hopefully you all have a version on your computer. It does require the, uh, the VE direct cable, um, which has a little uh, USB to RJ uh, or RS385 converter in the, in the handle. Um, and then you connect it to, to from your USB to, of your, your computer to the, um, the RJ port on the, uh, on the BMS. When you do that, you will see uh, this screen. This is the, the uh, info screen. It will show you the voltages of all the cells here. Um, you will see all the, the cells that are in balance, balancing uh, mode or marked in, in um, yellow. The reason being because it is, oops, it is at about uh, 0.1 volt disparity. So it is gonna start uh, balancing. Um, you're gonna see your, your capacity as far as the, the system um, has rated itself. 
a BMS is uh, what they call intelligent BMS. It does try and determine its own um, capacity. Uh, if you use your BMS uh, or your, your battery at only say 75% every time, you may see this, uh, this value deviate itself down to like 170 uh, amp hours. It doesn't actually limit the, um, the amount of power that can be drawn from the battery. Uh, if you do indeed uh, do more than 70% uh, for uh, some scenario, um, even though the uh, rated amp hours is, it hits zero and this uh, state of charge hits zero, the battery will keep on powering and the BMS will keep on powering because in reality, it does work off the voltage. So the, the values that are all here tend to be reporting values and indicative values. Um, they, they don't actually control the thing except perhaps current. Current does control, if it goes above 100, 160 amps, it will uh, drop, drop, drop the system. Um, over here, you've got the protection status. There's, there's no alarm written here. I'll show you in the next slide an, an alarm and, uh, and what the alarm is. And then here, if there is an alarm, in other words, a little, little yellow light flashing, uh, it will show you what, what the system is doing here. Um, this is actually quite nice. I think it's in, in float um, with, a, with a little bit of current. It's actually probably absorption right now. Um, and it's charging up here. You've got the... Um, the charge MOSFETs and the discharge MOSFETs are all on. Um, not, nothing really much to report. Down here, this is important. You do want to set the dip address correctly. If this dip address is set at zero and you have the dip address at one on the, um, on the BMS, then the software will not read it. So you have to match the dip address here with, uh, well, here with what is on the, uh, on the BMS. So if I have a two, in other words, if I have that, that one at zero and this one at uh, one, then this one would have to be two and it would have to be the same on the um, dip address on the BMS. And for those of you about to ask me what is the dip address, there is the dip address um, red box on the, uh, on the BMS. And those little switches are up or, up or down, doing a, a one or zero for the, um, for the ones or zero that, that are, are here on this, this screen. Felix, uh, Darby, yeah. Sorry, we got a, a question that actually fits in here very nicely. Um, I'm just going to say Yaku H. He asked, what's the maximum amount of batteries that can be connected in parallel on our system? And that, has, that interlinks with the DIP address. So maybe you can just explain how that works. Nicely, sir. Thank you. Um, so the maximum I've actually seen done is 33. But the maximum that is mathematically acceptable, I think, is 64. So from all of these numbers, you can get 64 different variations and connect it that way. Um, what you do in that case is uh, you connect every single BMS with a simple cat part cable. Um, and then at the one end, you then attach your BMS view. You then hit a, a little delay here. You say, do a four second delay. You then change your path count to 64. And you, you start at any number here, but you will see at every four seconds, because you hit the delay at four seconds, every four seconds, it will go to the next dip address and show you the overall status of, the, um, of, of that BMS or that battery, battery set and keep going through that. So you can actually, in the end, link um, a whole lot of BMSs, 64, and put them all together. And the biggest we've had so far is a 330 kilowatt hour system up here in Michalisburg with 33 BMSs on it. Nice question. Uh, here's a BMS view with alarm. So what I've done here is I've basically taken out one of the plugs uh, of, the, of the system, okay? Please don't do this when you have a high load going through. Uh, taking out the plug here actually does risk blowing a, um, a, a port or, or blowing the, um, the, the harness cables. 
in case you know could, could, there could be a, a high voltage or a high charge going through them if, um, during the time you unplug it. So if you do unplug it, please make sure your system is in uh, no charge or no discharge status. Um, just something to know. But I, I pulled this out, and you can see all these alarm cases over here. So voltage, SAM, electrical damage, something connection. That's basically saying I've got electrical damage here on these first five, excuse me, four cells. And an under voltage protection, because suddenly I've got a voltage sum of 39 volts when in, a, in natural fact it was 54, but anyway. Um, I've effectively removed uh, three times three, so no, four times three, so 12, maybe even 13 volts from the, from the system. Um, so you get an under voltage protection. So now my BMS has gone into protection and it has uh, alarms and protection coming in and it's, uh, it, will, it will not go away until I plug that, that the port stack in and it, it will then reset itself. Also of interest in this view, this uh, full battery capacity is cu coming in at 150 amp, amp hours. Um, what it, every single BMS will come uh, set at that and it will, uh, it will then find out from, from your maximum usage what the actual capacity is on the battery system that you put in there. So some installers have been doing a, a full charge up and a full discharge on the first uh, two or three days of the, of the installation, just to give that BMS the full idea of the, um, of the capacity on the, on the system. Um, since all of the batteries are rated at the low end, so if you get a 202 amp hour battery, the number of cells that will, the, the number of actual um, amp hours that the cells can produce will be 202 or above. So 203, 207, 205. Um, That's on the second life, right, Felix? Yes. Um, yes. So you will get the, a very nice response if you do that, uh, that full discharge. You know, you will see uh, 200, 202, whatever. Um, you, you may not see all of it because you might have a trip for another reason. Um, but if you try and do a maximum uh, charge up and a maximum discharge, you can get very nice results for that. Um, also of interest in this slide, you, you'll see the uh, remaining battery capacity is 75 amp hours. So what it does there is the BMS will assume that you have 50% data charge when you first come uh, turn on your system. Um, and you know, nine times out of 10, this is the first battery system that you installed, the battery is indeed at 50%. That's normally how they get, they get transported. Um, if you, if you have a shutdown due to a surge, due to a, um, an ESCOM surge or something like that, the remaining battery capacity will be assumed again by the BMS and it will be assumed to be 100% or 0% or 50%. I have no idea what it is and neither does the BMS until it, it has to do it. Um, so you do have the potential, um, especially in, uh, in trips and surges, you do have the potential to have a battery sitting at um, 54 volts, so effectively 100%, but the BMS reporting 0% uh, date of charge. And it, it automatically will correct itself with the first um, cycle. As a matter of fact, as soon as you put a charge to it, the, uh, the battery will charge up another you know, 0.3 volts, and then you'll see the, the BMS immediately says, no, I'm at 100% full now. So don't be alarmed if you see a disparity between the uh, BMS state of charge and the voltage. Uh, and as a matter of fact, always go with the voltage. Whatever the voltage is telling you, you, you know that that's the, um, the actual state of charge. Um, that disparity between SOC and, and reality is true for every BMS in the world and every um, system in the world. 
if you do have a coulomb counter and it has been chipped due to a surge it will when it comes on start up it will start up not knowing where it is and it will correct itself within one cycle um, the next view on the upper software is these are all the parameters you can see here um, in the second little block the pack over voltage delay, which it's in this case here is 1000 milliseconds. That's the one I was talking about earlier that I can adjust to two seconds in case of a dirty grid. Um, you know, obviously China doesn't expect you to have dirty grid and here in Africa we do. So we, we have got the flexibility and availability to adjust pretty much every parameter, although, you know, don't ask me to, to do every parameter. And you can then get the, uh, the, the value is correct. Also in current protect, I've actually got here, these are all the values without the 100 in it. They actually are supposed to be at uh, this is current, so overcurrent start is 150. Uh, discharge overcurrent start is 150. So here I've mimicked the, the problem I saw on a, um, uh, in, uh, a site that was installed. That must be um, 150, 150, 180, and 180 here. So please, I, sorry, that was me, me um, bad thinking, I meant to put 80 there. Um, so please check when you have this view on that, that the current protection is indeed 150 and 180 on, on these two. Um, on the 6,000 BMS that we have deployed out there now, I've only found this problem on one, so I had to recreate it here for you all. Uh, BMS config. Um, here, here's some nice information. Um, you can adjust the overall capacity of the, the battery using, using these here. Um, so I can change the, the value that is seen here in the info thing. Um, the big one that I use quite often here is actually a tab here called clear log. I haven't got it shown here, I'm sorry, but in the clear log, you will see a, a, a read and adjust button, a little bit like this, this one says adjust and reset. You will see a whole list, a little, again, a little bit like this, but it will be your number of short circuits, the number of overcounts, the number of, um, of over voltage, number of under voltage, uh, number of over temperatures, just a straight count. Um, from, the, from the beginning to, to now. And I have found that if I don't have any information in the storage value, which is uh, on the next tab, that I can go to the clear log and just hit the read buttons and now get an overall count of how many times the uh, BMS has been short circuited or stuff, stuff like that. So it's quite a good place to, to view things. Um, storage, uh, this, this is actually the history of the, um, the BMS, uh, what's been happening for the last uh, 1,200 um, uh, uh, alarms or, or alarm records. Um, I, I, the word here, alarm, did not mean, um, it, it did more mean like a message. Just for example, here, you in a... Uh, a state where there's no nothing happening, it's just either in charge or discharge. And so every half hour, it will just do a timing record. So it will record everything at, at the time. Um, I can see from here, I've actually unplugged one of the, um, one of the, the ports. So you can see it's not, um, not reporting any of those cells. Um, so anyway, you, you can read all the records and then save all the records. I use 64. Uh, bit saving and it, it comes out as a Excel file or a uh, comma separated uh, file. Um, finally, troubleshooting. This is the last slide, I'm sorry. Uh, this is, I just wanted to demonstrate what a, it, it, it's a solar fed um, battery system. And this is a Victron, as you can tell. Um, but it has, shows a very nice uh, uh, discharge curve during the, the early hours of the morning. And as the sun starts, it starts charging up quite nicely. Then there was some, some heavy usage and low, low sun, but it carried on charging up to 
the um, absorption voltage. So normally you'll see this curve actually uh, taper off quite nicely and get to this, this point and then go up to the um, absorption voltage. It was sit there for an hour and then drop down to the, uh, the float voltage and sit there until it starts being deployed at five, five o'clock in the afternoon. That is a very nice um, sort of horse shape, horse neck shape. You get a nice neck, the ears, and then the, the face or the, the nose of the horse. Um, so it, it is broken up here by the, by the sun, but that, that's okay. I do see the nice shape coming through. So you do want to try and make sure that your daily um, emulation of the, the site looks something like this. So it's just something worth sharing with you here. If you're not seeing that, I, I have seen that um, the state of charges and all that sort of stuff does go out of whack. And it does seem to, um, to take another day where it goes, uh, uh, it, 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 it goes into um, a, a sort of a charge, how do you say? They take another, another day of going into good charge to, uh, to get all the state of charges and everything correct. Um, I have got, um, I'm trying to do is show, show you another screen. Can you see my, my screen with, the, with a Victron Energy profile? It's a daily profile, can you see it now? Yes. It should say Wesley Francis up on the, on the screen. The, yeah. Excellent, thank you very much. That is actually a very nice discharge and then recharge using solar up to 100%. That curve there looks really good and that's, that's a one, uh, one 24 hour system. Um, it's just the, what, what I'd like to see every day. If you do that, the, uh, the BMS, the, the batteries, the inverter, all those systems, they run and they are in sync. If you have a couple of days of bad weather where the solar is not as sufficient as it is showing here, and you actually end up getting the batteries only to 80 or 90 or even 70% every day, and therefore it keeps uh, going out of sync, you could end up with the, um, the Victron reporting 100% full, even though you only have 53 volts on your battery. Um, don't be too concerned. As soon as you have a good day of solar, it will all correct itself and show correctly at 100% with 54.5 volts on the battery. If you want to avoid that, if you are having several days of poor service uh, by the sun, sorry, poor sun, um, what you can do in a Victron system is uh, implement scheduled charging that's in the ESS mode of the um, CCGX. And a scheduled charging would just come in at around about three o'clock and do, the, uh, do it for maybe an hour. You would then do your uh, scheduled charging for, um, for the client. And th that would be if you do not get into this um, horse's ear and nose sort of shape over here, which is quite, quite a nice shape to see. Okay, so y'all, any further questions? Um, I made a list of, of questions, Felix. I don't know if you maybe want to just open your chat and I'll, I'll, post, um, I'll post them there or I can read them to you if you want. Nice, uh, thank you for doing that, sir. Uh, let me, um, yeah, read, read the first question while I've, figure out how to get the chat okay, cool. on here. So from, from Yaku, we had a question. Please explain the usage of DVCC option in Victron with Revolve and does it have any benefit um, or is it required at all? Nice question. Thank you, Yaku. Uh, DVCC does do quite a nice um, uh, management of voltages and currents 
And so it tries to smooth out all the curves between um, the, the different systems, between the, the MPPT, the inverter, the grid, and the, um, the battery, and then again, maybe even generator. So yes, I would recommend using the DBCC. The other advantage about the DBCC, is, if you have it deployed, is you can remotely control the, um, the current, the charge current. So even though you have set the, uh, the Victron at, say, 90 amps of charge up, you can go in on the DVCC and just uh, adjust it down to 50 amps. Now, I know you can do it uh, using uh, VE config, but then you have to download the, v, the VE config file, edit it, and then upload it. Whereas if you're using um, uh, DVCC on the uh, CCGX, it's actually a, a much simpler process of just logging in and, and adjusting it. Um, but otherwise, yes, please use, uh, or I recommend using uh, DVCC uh, whenever you can. It actually handles surges better, just by the by. Cool. Um, okay, I think if Yaku doesn't have any comments on that, Yaku. We've got a next question from, from George that says, can you answer the paradox of the inverter fuse versus the battery fuse? Um, say the battery is 125 and the inverter says 200 amps. Um, I think maybe why do we recommend 125s? Unless George can maybe just clarify on that. Sorry if I missed anything. Mm. What, what I have seen is that your, uh, I think it's the Multi Plus uh, inverter has a built-in uh, 200 amp fuse. Um, yes, that is not enough. You should put in a, uh, uh, a 125 amp fuse on the DC, uh, uh, the, sorry, the positive DC power line down to the, the battery. Now, it is uh, in code, in electric code, to put a fuse on the, uh, the DC power line, and you do want to be able to disconnect the battery from the, um, from the, the uh, MPPT bus bar system whenever you can. So you do want to have uh, the ability to switch off things. And my advice then is to obviously put in a DC breaker between the uh, bus bar and the, um, and, the uh, and, and the battery system. Um, and yes, the 200 amp uh, fuse on the the, the, inside the Victron is not going to be sufficient. Um, what I have seen, it, it, this is perhaps something that's, which is quite important. Um, if you have a couple of battery systems and a couple of uh, inverter systems and a couple of MPPTs, so you have maybe three or four of each of those, what we have designed for a system um, before is a split bus bar system. So you end up having um, a positive and negative over here for your battery system, for, so it's a storage bus bar system. Then you have two thick copper cables going up to the positive and negative on the uh, service or supply bus bar system. So in effect, you have four thick copper um, bars, uh, two of them are, are negative and linked, and the other two are positive and linked. And they think with nice thick uh, cables. And then you put all your batteries on the two bottom ones and all your MPPTs and your inverters on the, the top ones. Um, what that does is it actually allows you to put in um, a, a measurement shunt on the negative uh, thick copper uh, cable. And you can actually end up having eight battery sets with one uh, shunt, measurement shunt, measuring all the all of those eight uh, combined voltages and, and current that they are being deployed through the system. And it also means you've separated your services and your storage. And it allows the 
protection systems and protection softwares that operate the storage side to operate independently from the the same protections and and uh, and protection requirements, software and hardware, on the storage side. So, in that scenario with the, the, the split bus bar design, you would then have your own individual breakers per battery set. Um, again, 125 um, uh, amp breakers. Uh, I have got a client who loves a big, thick um, uh, 250 amp breaker. And what he does there is he actually puts two battery sets uh, per, per breaker. And even, you know, you normally build it up in just a, in, in pairs. And it's a slight violation, but it's, it's completely um, uh, what's it with, you know, within code and so forth. Um, so I, I, I have looked the other way. It's, it's nice. Um, at least you had a nice DC breaker there. Um, so it's a switch that you switch on and off whenever it trips. It is, um, Anita made a, a very good comment in chat now. She says a multi plus 5 kVA can surge up to 10 kVA or, or roughly 8 kilowatts. So 125 amp fuse won't be sufficient. But I think for a system of that size, uh, it obviously depends on the customer. If a system can surge up to that, you might want to consider a 20 kilowatt hour battery. Um, you know, a 20 kilowatt hour battery can then handle technically up to 250 amps. Uh, just a suggestion, but you can go from there. No, that's, that's, that's correct. Um, if, if you throw in uh, more than 150 amps at the system, it, it is meant to trip, and you want it to trip, and you want it to go into, go into protection. Um, so what I, if you're doing it in terms of voltage, if there is a surge in terms of voltage, then I need you to put that, um, that voltage delay in there for you. But otherwise, um, on a return system that's surging up past, um, if, if the 5 kVA system is surging up past uh, 9 kVA, um, you, you might have other issues. You might want to just ad address that, or if you if you intended that, if you, int if you int intended that design, then maybe you need to have a little bit more battery power underneath. Let's just clear up the the fuses. So she she added. Um, so for two battery units, you will then need uh, one fuse per battery. So you'll technically need four 125 amp fuses, correct? Um, and then between your battery and your bus bar, you'll need a 200 amp fuse per inverter. But if I'm correct, if you have two fuses per BMS, you don't really need a master um, fuse disconnect, unless obviously you want to put one in. Um, That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. You can open. Nice. Um, you guys are welcome to unmute yourself if you have questions that um, aren't in chat. Actually, what I was about to suggest is it's been an hour and a half. I'm sure you're all brain dead. I know, I, you know, listening to me talk is, is tedious. Uh, so please um, use any questions that you have come up with. Uh, if you don't want to talk about it now, just send it to me, send it to, to Darby. Uh, send it to Steve. Steve's very good about um, uh, beating me up until I, I give him an answer. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we always try and respond to all. And I will send out a, um, a version of this, uh, this PPT if you want it. Um, I don't think it's that informative unless uh, you have me talking to it. Um, but if, if you want it, you know, I can most definitely send it out. If that's okay, uh, then thank you very much for joining us.